All right, we are at five o'clock. So uh, thanks everyone out there for joining us. Uh, my name is Todd Gonzalez. I'm a board member with the Flagstaff Festival of Science. Just a few things to remind you about for the Festival of Science. Uh, one, we have lots of other events that are, are being played live on our website. So if you're tuning in right now through our website, you already know, but if you're turning in, tuning in through YouTube or watching this later on, uh, it's www.scifest2020.org. Uh, and you can watch these live as they as they occur, and you can submit questions on the website. So during this next presentation, uh, go to the website, scifest2020.org, uh, and uh, there'll be a question uh, box right underneath the screen. And so just go ahead and send a question to Dan, uh, and uh, we'll get that and we'll ask him toward the end of the show. Another thing you can do for us that would really help is fill out the survey every time you watch an event. Let us know how it went. You know, what, what are your thoughts? How, how would you change next year? Uh, how would, how would uh, uh, any types of uh, uh, feedback you can give the festival would be great. It's how we build this program uh, every year, year after year. Uh, STEM kits are still available. So at the Flagstaff Downtown Library, you can go get your STEM kit tomorrow uh, and they will be open from 10 to four at the Downtown Library. And then if you're on the East Side, the East Side Library will be offering those kits uh, tomorrow and Saturday, and they will be open uh, from 10 to 2, and you don't need a library card for that. So I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dan Kalath, and uh, Dan is a, a research assistant with NEU and uh, is studying something that, believe it or not, we all have sort of an interest in right now. Uh, 2020 is the year of, of pathogens, and even though we're talking about viruses throughout 2020 and, you know, bacteria in the many years before that, uh, Dan's going to give us a little bit of a look into valley fever, which I understand is a fungus. Uh, and so, uh, Dan, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you for being here for us. Yeah, thanks a lot, Todd. I uh, really appreciate you having me. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, we should be good to go here. All right. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really stoked to be here um, and uh, in this crazy time uh, during this pandemic and still uh, going forward with the Festival of Science. Um, so my name is Dan Kolath. I am a PhD student in, at NAU in the Department of Biological Sciences at uh, the Pathogen and Microbiome Institute in the Barker Lab. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, valley fever today um, and among other uh, fungal pathogens as well. So uh, here we go. So what I want to talk about uh, in my talk, I'm going to give a little background on fungi themselves, um, as well as the background in valley fever. I'm going to focus in uh, Arizona because that's where we're at. Um, I'm going to talk about, I focus on the ecology of valley fever. Um, so if you're interested, I'm not going to go too much into the um, disease outcome in humans of, the, uh, of this disease. But if you're interested, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm going to focus more on the impact on wildlife um, as well as um, uh, the ecology. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some other fungal pathogens um, and some, some pathogens that my lab, uh, you know, discovered potentially. Um, and then talk about those implications on wildlife as well. So this first figure, um, it's a lot going on. This is a phylogenetic tree of uh, fungi. So, you know, fun, Fungi are this giant group, um, and this is just a zoomed in version of the dicaria, uh, the two biggest groups of fungi, um, the basidiomycota and the ascomycota, uh, and you might know them as the basidiomycota are the mushrooms, and the ascomycota are the uh, molds um, and the yeasts. Um, and I just wanted to do this to show you um, this little red box down here is the group, the order of fungi called the enigonales that my lab is, is most interested in. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and this, this group consists of a lot of pathogens and animal associated fungus. Um, and I'm gonna take a page out of my boss's handbook. Um, when she gives a talk about fungal pathogens, she always mentions the good that fungi do uh, for the world uh, before we get into you know, all the bad stuff, all the gnarly diseases. A page out of her book and just talk about you know some of the good stuff that fungi do for the environment and for us as humans uh, so obviously 
you know, we wouldn't be anywhere without, you know, beer and bread and food production, um, you know, Saccharomyces, that wonderful yeast that gives us, uh, you know, the byproduct of ethanol and carbon dioxide that produces bread in, uh, in our beer, right? Um, but also, you might know, you know, uh, uh, secondary metabolites that other fungi give off. Uh, penicillin is one of them, antibiotics. Um, and fungi are, are ecologically very important, right? We consider them a keystone species. They're, you know, on top, the, the, the most important decomposers in many environments. Um, but there's also the bad. And I'm, unfortunately, my talk is going to be focused on the bad. Uh, so some of the bad stuff that fungi do, you know, food spoilage, you leave a piece of fruit out and uh, it, it goes bad. You see a white fluffy mold on, on the fruit. Um, so, you know, it's spoiled. Um, allergies are another one. So there's, you know, millions of fungal spores in the air floating around in our house and dust. And, you know, if you are sensitive to those spores and you, you develop an immune response, you know, that's where we get some allergies from, uh, from, from fungi. Um, and the baddest of the bad, the pathogens, right? So fungi uh, uh, parasitize plants and animals. And I'm going to be focusing on uh, the animal pathogens in this talk. So I just want to give a shout out because in Todd said it best, um, we don't really think about fungi uh, that much besides those of us who study it. Uh, you know, if you ever take a microbiology class, you, you, you might have just focused on bacteria and maybe, you know, viruses, but fungi tend to get overlooked. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, get a slide in here that shows the importance of studying fungi. And I'm just going to, you know, just, there's just a couple of reasons. There's obviously many more. Um, but, you know, for the good, you know, biocontrol and bioremediation. So, um, the, you know, we know that there's tons of plastic and pollutants in the environment that are getting pumped in, you know, by human causes. And there's a lot of research being done right now on how to get rid of that by you know, using biological organisms. And fungi are a, you know, a top of the list of organisms to get rid of, you know, oils and plastics in the environment. So you see here to the right, this is a, a electron micrograph of a white rot fungus actually degrading plastic in the environment. So we could use um, fungi as a bioremediation tool, um, as well as biocontrol. So there's people working on fungi uh, to reduce you know, invasive insects that might wipe out crop yields in certain parts of the world. And fungi that uh, uh, parasitize these insects may reduce those insect population and uh, reduce those uh, negative impacts that insects may have. More something that I'm more interested in and my lab's more interested in is emerging fungal pathogens. Um, and there's, there's, this is just one example of an emerging fungal pathogen. Um, this is Candida auris, you may have heard of it. It's, you know, it's, it's this fungus that, that emerged in Asia a few years ago and spread rapidly throughout the world. And it's, it's naturally antifungal resistant and it's, it's a nosocomial infection. So an infection that is inquired in a hospital setting and could wreak havoc on people that are especially immunocompromised. So they get these really nasty infections. Um, but this isn't the only emerging fungal pathogen. I'll get into some in this talk as well. Uh, Bally fever is considered an emerging fungal pathogen as well. So I also just wanted to give a shout out to NAU. Um, I just wanted to, you know, there's, and forgive me if anyone's from NAU and I missed you on this list, but uh, I just wanted to, you know, give a shout out to people studying fungi, fungi at NAU. Um, so the Gehring Lab, uh, Dr. Kitty Gehring is an amazing uh, microbial, uh, mi mycorrhizal ecologist. So mycorrhizae is this symbiont of plants that is super important for uh, plants to survive, as well as environmental fungi they study in that lab. Uh, I know my uh, a fellow grad student, Scott, who's, who's doing work that is looking at communities of uh, wood decomposition and describing the communities of burned versus unburned sites, um, which we know, you know, fires are uh, every, uh, you know, a common occurrence here in the West. So super important work being done there. Uh, the Foster Lab, there, you know, Dr. Foster is a expert on the white nose syndrome, which I'll talk about a little bit later. It's a really nasty pathogen of bats. Um, and the Hofstetter Lab, I don't know too much about their lab, but I know that they do microbial insect interactions, and I know fung fungi are a part of that. And I think they're working on 
um, actually biocontrol or, or looking at the fungus that infects bark beetles as a biocontrol to um, prevent bark beetle infections in uh, ponderosa pine stands. And then Barker Lab, that's the lab I am a part of. And we focus on you know, valley fever, a lot of different aspects of valley fever research, uh, as well as other vertebrate uh, fungal pathogens. So a lot being done at NAU right here in Flagstaff. So I want to dive into this order of niganales. And this is a phylogenetic tree. Um, it's kind of zoomed in to kind of focus on the a human, significant human pathogen. So you see the biohazard signs over there. Those are uh, groups that have significant human pathogens in there. But this is a weird order of fungi because, you know, if you think about fungi, you think about decomposition, uh, you think about plant associations, but this, this group of fungi has a high density of vertebrate, not only vertebrate pathogens, but fungi that are associated with animal and animal materials. So we don't, there's, there's not many things out there, microbes out there that could break down uh, the keratin and other, other uh, animal derived proteins and materials, but there's a lot of uh, fungi in this group that have the enzymatic capability to break down keratin, um, to parasitize animals of all kind, um, from, from insects to reptiles to higher mammals. So this is a kind of a strange group in the fungal kingdom um, and also human pathogens as well. So this is the group that I, I, I'm gonna be focusing on you know, throughout my talk. And here's a few examples. I should have warned you about pictures. I'm gonna, I have some pictures, they're not too bad, um, but some uh, infections that fungi in this order cause, right? So the top right, this is just athlete's foot, you know, we're, common fungal infection of the skin. Caused, caused by dermato, uh, dermatophy, dermatophytic fungi that is related, they're related to um, the valley fever fungus that I'll talk about. Um, below that is a lung infection of valley fever, is an x-ray of a lung nodule uh, of a patient that's infected with valley fever. And then you see a poor snake that has a pretty gnarly fun, uh, fungal infection on the, on the scales. Um, this is another fungus in the group, uh, Aniganales. And then this is a, another valley fever infection to the left here of a dog that happened to get a fungal infect or a valley fever infection that has disseminated valley fever that uh, formed a lesion on the bones of the hip. Um, so pretty gnarly stuff here in the order, Aniganales. So throughout the order, there is, so, so these fungi are environmental fungi, they're free living. They have an environmental component of their life cycle, um, but they also have a, different morphology when they infect the host, right? We call that dimorphism. And these are just a few examples. And these are uh, significant human pathogens. Blastomyces is common in the, uh, the, the Midwestern United States. Of course, coccidioides causes valley fever, common in the Southwest and among others. But you can see they have an environmental component as well as a host component. Um, and the environmental component is usually a common morphology. It's called mycelia. It's the free living uh, vegetative growing state of fungi. They grow on a substrate and this is where they get their nutrients, they eat. And then when they infect a host um, by a few different means, there's a morphological shift that allows them to be a better pathogen, right? So at the top and at the bottom, you see a few examples of yeast, uh, yeast cells that are uh, the pathogenic state and then you have this coccidioides. So this is the valley fever fungus. It forms this very unique spherule structure. And I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later, but basically this is very unique to the fungal kingdom. Um, it forms the spherule structure from a uh, asexual spore. And this spherule structure is filled with endospores. So if this spherule ruptures, you have uh, endospores throughout the body. And this is when you get disseminated disease, right? Um, but yeah, this, this figure is just demonstrating that there's many different uh, morphologies or, or dimorphisms throughout this order and allows these particular fungi to be better pathogens. These are uh, virulence factors. So let's get into the actual disease. Um, so coccidiomycosis, commonly known as valley fever, um, is caused by two species in the genus coccidioides, um, coccidioides imidis, is a is the what's thought of as the California species, 
And then Coxidioides posidaceae was called the Arizona species. And this is the most common species. It, it dominates the, the, uh, all the other parts of the range of this fungi. Um, so like I said before, they're, they're, these are dimorphic fungi. Um, they're endemic soil fungi. So this free living state is in the soil. Um, and it's endemic, meaning it's, you know, it's endemic to the Southwest, but you know, this meaning it's lived here for a long time. It evolved here, right? Um, so this, these fungi are capable of infect, infecting all mammals and even some reptiles. So there's been some experiments um, on what it can and cannot affect infects um, and, and naturally as well. And it's, it's thought that this, this fungus can infect all mammals, wild and in captivity, and even some reptiles. Um, the ecology, which, which I'm focused on, is not well described. Um, so what it's doing in the environment, uh, the factors that influence transmission to humans is not really well described. There's, there was a lot of work done in the early days in the 50s and 60s and 70s that really hasn't been followed up on since. So that's where my work has come into play to kind of go back and, um, and you know, revisit these hypotheses that came up back then. Um, and this is an environmental, environmentally acquired disease. The only way a mammal can get infected by this disease is by in, in, inhaling airborne spores or uh, asexual arthrocnidia. Um, it's not, you can't get it from, it's, you can't get it person to person. Um, it, it's very, very rare. Someone would have to have an open cut and then, you know, the other two people would have open cuts. So it's very rare to, to have uh, person to person transmission. So it is an environmentally acquired disease. And this is uh, uh, microscopy of the, the infectious propagule. It's called an arthrocnidia or an asexual spore. And these barrel like structures will get dispersed via the, the wind and in the air and some unlucky mammal will inhale them. And that's when uh, infection takes place. So this is a map of the CDC, uh, the CDC put out, and this is the map of the endemic areas for valley fever. And you can see, you know, they have different shades of green uh, for highly endemic, established endemic, and suspected endemic. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's across the Southwest, but as I hope to convince you later in the talk that we need, there's a need to update this map. Um, it might not be as accurate as, you know, when it was first made, right? So Southwest United States down into Mexico. And it's also, I didn't show it here, but also parts of South America as well. Now, I'm not, like I said at the beginning of the talk, I'm not gonna talk too much about the human component or, or disease rates, but if you have a question, I'll be more than happy to answer them. But this is uh, the number of reported cases by the CDC uh, from 1998 to 2017. Um, and you could see that Arizona is the dominant state of reports um, of this disease, followed by California and then all other states where it's reported. So you see a, uh, a steady trend and then a drop off. But if this, uh, if this graph extended out to 2020, you would see a, another spike in uh, disease rates as well. So this is the case rates. Okay, so what I'm interested in, so this is the life cycle of the organism. Um, so on the left, you have the saprophytic life cycle or the free living soil life cycle. It's free living in the soil. And on the right is the parasitic life cycle, All right? This is the proposed life cycle that we thought was the, was the only thing um, for a long time. Um, so you have the, um, the, you know, it's growing as a mycelia, like I showed earlier. It, it forms these asexual reproductive structures, arthrocnidia, these are the infectious spores. Um, you know, this, this is for to disperse to new nutrient sources. Um, and then it gets dispersed via the, the wind and then an unlucky mammal inhales it and then it creates this dramatic shift in morphology into its parasitic uh, spherical structure. And then, you know, if, 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 a, if it, not, it doesn't always happen, but if a spherical ruptures, you get disseminated disease. And this is when you get things like uh, lesions on bones and even uh, fungal meningitis, which is the uh, most severe disease. Um, but what I'm more focused on is the, to the left, the saprophytic cycle, because that's where our knowledge gap is. Um, we don't know the ecological factors, either abiotic or biotic, that are contributing to uh, densities of infectious propagule production, 
Um, we don't know that really a, a, a reliable distribution in the soil, um, in the environment. When we go out and sample, um, it's really hard to detect this organism. And we don't really know why, if it's climate, climate um, influence, if it's uh, maybe some other a competition influence, a biotic uh, influence, or if it's host influence, right? So this is what I'm really interested in, this part of the life cycle. So for my master's project, um, I really wanted to get a better understanding on like, where does this fungus live? Um, and when I started the project, we dove back into the literature from those original studies and um, there's been, there was a lot of work done in suggesting that there's a relationship with desert rodents, um, that it's living in the burrows, it's living, you know, inside these rodents and maybe causing disease and, you know, getting back into the soil. So that's where I wanted to explore. So for my master's, I went out and I collected a bunch of soil throughout Arizona. Um, and I extracted the DNA from the soil. I extracted soil from burrows and non-burrows to compare the, the, the rate that we detected it um, between the burrows and the non-burrows and if the animal material or the animals themselves had anything to do with it. Um, so I extracted the DNA. Um, I employed these molecular methods it's called real-time uh, quantitative PCR, which basically amplifies a specific region of the coccidioides genome. Um, that um, is very specific to coccidioides. So where it's reliable that, um, that we're detecting the actual pathogen. So these are molecular methods that we use because it's very hard to culture the organism from the soil. So I went out to five different sites in Arizona, um, two sites in Northern Arizona, one by Lake Mead, um, Flagstaff itself, and then three sites in uh, central to southern Arizona and did the, did the study with the boroughs and the non-boroughs. Um, and then what I found was pretty interesting after doing the statistics and everything um, that there's a positive relationship with animal boroughs. So we detect the, the, the fungus in animal boroughs almost three times more often than in just regular soil. Um, so which is really interesting. So it gives us a more reliable uh, method when we when we have to go out and sample and study that more and study it to look in animal burrows. Um, so it's a more reliable technique. We can study it a little bit better. Uh, we also something that we didn't expect in the study is the detection of the fungus outside of the highly endemic region. So I when we started the study, we thought we would only detect the fungus in southern Arizona because that's the highly endemic region. We know it's there um, where the most cases are. But we found quite a bit of the fungus in northern Arizona as well. So, which brings me to the, the necessity to kind of re, redo that endemic map, right? So this gave us a pretty good understanding, or not understanding, but a pretty good clue that, you know, maybe there's something more to this animal hypothesis, right? Maybe this fungus is, has an association with animals in some way, rather than just infecting them. So my PI, Dr. Bridget Barker and John Taylor, who is from California, uh, UC Berkeley, have this, I, they, they've been studying this fungus for many, many years and always had this hypothesis in mind called the endozoan hypothesis, um, which basically states that, you know, this fungus is living in uh, wild rodents, desert rodents, either, you know, symptomatically, maybe, maybe killing them with the, the disease, or asymptomatically, maybe just living as a commensal of some kind. And then when the rodent succumbs to disease or just dies of natural causes, you know, the spiral bursts, it, come, it, it transforms back into its vegetative mycelial structure where it can digest. It has the enzymatic capability of digesting animal carcasses, animal protein, and then gets recycled back into the, um, the soil where, you know, it forms its sexual or as asexual reproductive structures, the infectious propagules, and either, you know, an unlucky uh, rodent gets infected, you know, and continues that cycle in the burrow uh, system, or an unlucky mammal, uh, a novel host, if you will, gets infected, and then, you know, it's kind of a dead end host. Um, so this kind of, the, the data we got from my master's study, it kind of supports this hypothesis. 
Um, and so, and then also what I said before is there may be a need to update this endemic region. Um, but to me, it just says that, you know, we don't know a lot about where this, the distribution of this fungus in the soil in the natural environment. So we need more extensive sampling throughout Arizona and the Southwest. And I, and I would say even the West itself, um, because there's a lot of gaps in the knowledge then, you know, I'm driving through, uh, you know, Moab, Utah, and I know that there's no cases there, but you know, it looks, it looks like a, you know, a prime habitat for this fungus to live. So just more extensive sampling. Uh, we need more researchers to get out there and, and sample the environment as well. So, you know, if, you know, nothing else, either it, something that came out of this study is, you know, we need more people studying this fungus. All right, so another question I had after this study is so, you know, it's in rodent burrows a lot. Uh, we detect it consistently. Um, you know, we could, we could have this support for this endozoan hypothesis, but is it impacting wild populations? Is it, you know, is, is wildlife populations um, like circulating and housing, uh, acting as a reservoir for this pathogen in the, in the wild and then causing, you know, spillover events to humans, you know, by accident. So for my PhD, I am really interested in, you know, trying to, you know, chip away at some of these questions. So we have an amazing partnership with AZ Game and Fish. Some of their retired um, uh, agents are, you know, have been really helpful in uh, trapping and uh, collecting uh, rodent specimens and collecting their lungs specifically because the uh, disease initiates in the lungs. So we get the lungs, and I want to investigate, you know, what's the, you know, what's the rate at which we can detect. Coccidioides, the valley fever pathogen in wild rodent populations, as well as looking at the whole fungal community in the lungs and seeing what else is out there. If there's co-infections with fungi that we don't really understand, we don't really have, have described and possible human pathogens. Um, so amplicon sequencing is a way to do that. Um, this is a molecular method where you amplify DNA markers, you know, extract DNA from the lungs, you amplify DNA markers and, you know, with some finagling and bioinformatics, uh, you get a sense of what the, the fungal community is in these lungs. Um, and this is and another important thing to come out to, I would like to come out of this is looking at co-infections with other microbes and other pathogens. Um, so if we look at things like bacteria and viruses um, and protozoans, we could get a sense of what pathogens are circulating in wild rodent populations and, uh, and have the possibility to cause a spillover event into humans. Um, and I don't know if you heard of the COVID-19 pandemic, but that's basically how it started, right? So uh, looking at pathogens circula circulating in wild populations is a great way to uh, model and predict uh, spillover events. And then that might, you know, chip away at some of these answers that you know are are wild rodents and animals really reservoirs for this pathogen, right? So um, if they are, if the rodents are uh, housing the the pathogen in the environment, and it's you know it's 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 you know certain hot spots or um, spots where there's a high density of the pathogen might be you know a dangerous spot for a human, uh, or certain times of year if there's a climatic component. Uh, might be, you know, there, we do see a, um, a seasonal shift in cases. So maybe that has to do with the animals, right? And then another aspect of my research is, is using statistics and mathematical models to model the organism and predict uh, like when it's going to, when outbreaks are going to occur. And if we start to answer these questions of animal reservoirs, and if there is an animal reservoir, we have to take into the account the, the animal uh, aspects as well. So things like the vegetation, so things that they live under, things they eat, um, climate. We know the climate, you know, influences animal uh, animal behavior and animal, you know, densities and stuff like that. And then animal behavior as well. If there's certain times where they aggregate to mate, or there's certain times where they, you know, certain times of year where there's die-offs or whatever um, that might influence more infectious propagules. Uh, we have to take that in consideration into our models. 
So things that we're working on uh, for the future. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk and away from Valley Fever and talk about um, other fungal pathogens to kind of allude to um, my last part of the talk, which is um, some nigan alien fungi that we came across and almost a side project in our lab that turned out to be really interesting. Um, so that has to do with conservation of wild populations and fungal pathogens. And I just wanted to start off this part of the talk by um, giving some examples of different other fungal pathogens that influence uh, wild populations. So white nose syndrome, I mentioned earlier in the talk, is a devastating fungal disease that infects bats around the world. And it's really taking a huge toll on bat populations. Um, it's, it's a very nasty disease. The same with the chytridiomycosis, the number two down. Um, it's, it's, it infects amphibian populations. It's a very gnarly skin disease of amphibians that's really causing a massive decline in amphibian populations around the world. Um, this snake fungus, which not a lot is known about it, it's kind of a new emerging disease. Um, it, it, it's a skin disease as well of, of snakes and we don't really know too much about it. So it potentially could be, uh, have some conservation impacts as well. And the aniganales, so I'm gonna just call them the aniganales fungus for now, um, uh, possibly causing impacts in uh, the black-footed ferret reintroduction process in Aubrey Valley, Arizona, which I'm gonna talk about next. So here's a couple of examples. So here's white nose fungus uh, to, the, to the top left here. Um, so it gets its name because it infects the area around the nose of the bats. Um, so pretty, pretty nasty. Um, the chytrids, this poor frog is infested with chytrid fungus and uh, it's not, not looking good. And this schematic down here, this is a graph from a paper in 2020. Um, that there's a lot going on, but basically the, the takeaway I wanted to get from this, from this graph is um, the decline of amphibian populations per country. Um, so the larger the, the frog icon, the, the greater the uh, species decline. So you can see it's, it's pretty far spread um, across the world that this fungus is really causing damage. Um, and you know, it's, these are things that we need to study more to get a better understanding of and how to uh, conserve these populations. So the black-footed ferret is a native uh, ferret to Arizona. It is a, it's the most uh, endangered mammal in North America. Uh, so it's native to Arizona. Um, it is a you know a burrowing mammal, um, which you know it's close to the ground. It makes it susceptible to possible fungal infections, um, and it's also you know being reintroduced in Aubrey Valley, Arizona. Um, its favorite food source is the Gunnison prairie dog. So it eats these prairie dogs. Um, and, you know, if you, you know, Flagstaff's notorious for having, you know, plague outbreaks among prairie dog populations. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, negative things associated with prairie dogs, um, but that's the food source for these ferrets. So there, the site of the ferret reintroduction is in Aubrey Valley, Arizona, uh, west of Flagstaff. It's near Seligman, Arizona, if you're familiar. Um, it's a lower elevation, uh, pinion juniper dominated on the cliffs, grassland in the valleys, um, and it's home to the largest prairie dog colony in Arizona. And so this is the site of the ferret reintroduction. Um, plenty of food, you know, it, it seems like a good, good area to reintroduce the ferrets, right? Um, so this was led by, we, our lab didn't really have, we're not a part of the reintroduction. Um, it was led by Arizona Game and Fish. Um, and the, the, the reintroduction was, you know, uh, you know unsuccessful. Um, so they had die-offs and they didn't really know why. So, you know, first thing that came to mind is plague. Um, so they go out and investigate the prairie dog populations to see if there's a sign of plague. Um, hantavirus is another one. Um, they didn't really detect plague or hantavirus, so they didn't really know what to do. So we came in, they thought it might, maybe it's valley fever. So uh, our lab went out to investigate. We collected soil um, and we actually got prairie dog. They, uh, they called some prairie dogs to get some tissues to, so, uh, for us to investigate um, for valley fever. 
So we um, you know, took these lungs, we did DNA extractions um, from the soil as well as the lungs. We did that quantitative qPCR method. Um, we didn't find any valley fever in the soil, um, but we, you know, we went investigated the lungs. We also tried to culture um, fungi from the lungs. And then we went in a, a deeper sequencing um, regime here to identify what those fungus were, um, as well as look at the microbial or the fungal community um, with this microbiome sequencing up top. So here is a picture of all the different fungi that we cultured from these lungs. Um, and to me, this is just really astounding that we got um, all these different you know, fungi living in the lungs um, of prairie dogs in Aubrey Valley, Arizona. Um, it's really cool, there's a lot of diversity here. Um, and people who study anigonales or valley fever, you know, these are highly suspect. They look, they look like what you would see if you're culturing valley fever and another anigonales, but a lot of fungi grow white fluffy molds, right? So we have to go uh, use the molecular methods to identify. So this is the community, uh, the microbiome sequencing of the lungs. And we actually, so this is like base level, the first pass at what's there. Um, and we actually detected some fungi that are, you know, either related or are coccidioides, right? And some other human and mammal uh, relevant fungal pathogens, right? So you see that here. Um, so pretty interesting that we see these, these, these inigonalian fungi coming up in prairie dog lungs where these ferrets are being reintroduced and in contact with the soil, okay? And then we took a dive into the um, fungal diversity of what we cultured. And you see here, the distribution is almost all, you know, over half of the distribution of fungi that we got was a Niganalian fungi, um, the pathogens, you know, that I talked about in the beginning of the talk, um, which is even more suspicious, right? And then we did one, one step farther um, to the whole genome sequencing. And this is a phylogenetic tree of, you know, a group of the Niganales. That, and we wanted to see where these new fungi from the, uh, from the prairie dog lungs kind of fell amongst these other pathogens. Um, and you can see the red lines are the pathogens that, or the, the, the fungi that we, we cultured and, um, and, uh, and got out of the lungs. And we, we, we had whole genome sequencing. And, and these are fitting in and related to other known uh, fungal pathogens of mammals and um, uh, uh, humans as well. So very interesting that we got these, you know, weird fungi out of the lungs. Um, they're coming in contact possibly with ferrets that are being reintroduced to this area, right? So what does that mean for the ferrets? And this is just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm speculating that, you know, they're raised in Colorado, they're reintroduced in Northern Arizona. Um, they're already, they're, there's possible inbreeding going on, which will lower the uh, immune system of these ferrets. They are possibly coming in contact with these fungal pathogens, um, either, you know, from the prairie dogs that they eat or, you know, just from the soil and the environment, uh, which might make them a, a, a lot more susceptible to these infections, all right? Um, so I guess I'm trying just to to convey that maybe it's not the first thing you look at, the, the hantavirus and the plagues, that we have to dig deeper dive into not just the ferrets, but other populations that might be on a decline and we don't know why, to investigate these things that maybe you don't think of, so fungal pathogens, um, you know, weird viruses, protozoans, stuff like that. So that was a kind of cool side project that we kind of just fell into and um, our postdoc, Marcus Teixeira, who's back in Brazil now, is the lead on that, and we should be publishing it soon. Um, it's really, really cool project that I'm glad we, we did, and hopefully it helps the conservation aspect. So just to wrap up the talk, um, so the conclusions from my talk, so coccidioides, the valley fever fungus, um, you know, potentially has an association with animals and could be a potentially impacting wild populations in Arizona. Um, Coccidioides is not alone out there. It's not the only fungal pathogen. Uh, we have a lot that we don't know and we should investigate and try to get more people to study. 
Um, and yeah, and this possibly could have a conservation impact on, you know, not just black-footed ferrets, but other populations that could be on the decline that are susceptible to, or possibly susceptible to these um, fungal pathogens and other pathogens as well. Uh, so that's my talk. I'm going to wrap it up. I really appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. And uh, I'd like to thank my lab, my entire lab, my, of course, my PI, Bridget Barker, um, and Game and Fish folks, and the Flagstaff Festival of Science folks for having me here. It was super fun. Um, I know it's a really weird time, and you know I'm in shorts right now and at my house, but uh, I'm still glad we got to do this. And I would be happy to take any questions as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, we did get a few questions in. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start from the top here. Um, so uh, we, we got, uh, let's see, first one here. Uh, Marcy uh, from Sedona asks, uh, I had valley fever in 2012 while living in Flag. The hospital had seen only a couple of cases, so it was misdiagnosed until it reached stage two. Are there any long-term effects for having uh, valley fever that you know of? So I'm, I'm going to start off, I'm not an MD, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, diagnose anybody, but, um, you know, it, it seems to me in, in humans and, um, you know, people who've had the disease and, and this, you know, look, reading case studies and stuff, um, you know, if you get the treatment, it kind of suppresses the disease, the immune, you know, it, it either, you know, it doesn't kill the fungus, the treatments, um, but it suppresses it enough for your immune system to kind of take hold of it. Um, until, you know, immunocompromised, you know, you get immunocompromised with age, your immune system kind of on the decline, and then it kind of gives the fungus an opportunity to kind of flare up, right? So that's not always the case. That's, you know, it, I don't, you know, um, you might not decline, your immune system might not decline enough for the fungus to flare up again, um, but that's a possibility. That could be a long, long-term effect uh, of the disease. Okay. Uh, another question from uh, Derek here in Flagstaff. How does the process of infection for valley fever differ from infection from a virus or a pathogenic bacteria? What are some methods employed by your lab to discover and predict future fungal pathogens? Right. Uh, so yeah, fungi are, there's not a lot of fungi that are um, transmissible person to person. So if we think about, you know, like viruses, like the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and uh, you know measles, let's say, or it's a highly transmissible person to person, um, and it still it causes aerosols, and that's how like the initial infection starts, I guess. Um, but those aerosols, are, are, the viral aerosols, can't live in the environment for too long, right? This is, which is why you know outside is 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 safer than being inside. Uh, vi uh, fung fungi are mostly environmental pathogens, or fungal pathogens are mostly environmental. They have that free living stage, so they evolve to live in the environment. So those spores can live on surfaces for, you know, a long time, a lot longer than a viral particle could. Um, and it's a, a lot more, um, a lot more dependent on the, the climate, the environment itself. So temperature dependent, uh, moisture dependent weather dependent, stuff like that. So it's a lot more in tune to the environment with these transmit like transmission events. Like if we get like valley fever outbreaks, it could be because there's a dust storm, um, stuff like that. And uh, I guess methods for our lab. Um, so we are trying to, we've been trying to work with different groups that um, monitor dust in, in highly endemic areas of, uh, of um, of Tucson and Phoenix, stuff like that. So dust collectors and, and sample to see if we could detect the pathogen um, and see different times of years. Maybe there's different uh, times of years where you get more dust and, and or I mean more uh, pathogen and least pathogen. Um, so that's one way with these molecular methods. And then just like I said in my talk, going out and sampling different environments, soil and, um, and, and rodent tissue and, and animal tissue to see what's out there. I think that's, in my opinion, that's the, the greatest way is to see what pathogens, not just valley fever, but other fungal pathogens are out there and could potentially spill over to humans, potentially. All right. Uh, Derek again asks uh, from Flagstaff, uh, what areas, uh, climate, particularly in uh, South America, are the optimal, op optimal conditions for valley fever to replicate? Does the climate itself alter growth or is it more um, 
more the type of, of rodent that is pre prevalent in the area? That's a great question. Um, the, the, the short answer is we don't really know, but we, we do know that it's found in the drier areas of uh, South America, drier areas of Brazil and Venezuela, um, the more deserty areas, um, you know, similar to the Southwest United States. Um, uh, I think the second part of the question was, you know, climactic variables that um, influence replication. We, we don't know. Um, I, I'm doing some of this work, and this is preliminary, that suggests that, um, you know, moisture is a big part of it. Um, you know, it gets, you know, fungi need a little bit of moisture to kind of get going, and then it kind of dries out, and then it influences uh, sporulation. Um, but the, the short answer is we don't really know. We don't have conclusive evidence of what exact factors influence uh, sporulation and in, in uh, like densities of infectious propagules in the environment. But moisture and temperature seem to be playing a role, but we don't know how yet. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, Virginia from Flagstaff asks, uh, I first heard about valley fever in geology class. Apparently this fungus lives in the soil and right after the 1994 earthquake the North Ridge, in Northridge, California, there was a spike in cases associated with dispersal of dust clouds that were kicked up from the earthquake uh, induced by landslides. Uh, there's not uh, that many earthquakes and landslides in Arizona. So how does the fungus spread around AZ? Uh, dust storms, how, how long can it survive in a dust cloud? That's another great question. And I'll start off by saying we don't know. <laughs> But you are correct that, so that there's a lot of good case studies on that earthquake and valley fever outbreaks after that earthquake. Um, and, and yeah, it, you know, you think, you know, earthquakes, you know, disturbing the soil um, and it's gonna create a lot of debris and dust in the air, which is gonna expose humans to more dust particles and potentially like dormant valley fever living, you know, somewhere where it might not have been disturbed. Um, in Arizona, so the, the other question, you know, she got diagnosed in Flagstaff, I think she said, so we don't know how far these spores can travel if, if there's localized infections in Flagstaff, because we do see infections in Flagstaff, not nearly as many as down in the valley, or is the fungus actually like getting dispersed via, you know, dust storms or even the wind itself from uh, like a Tucson or a Phoenix up to Flagstaff? Um, there is other studies on different fungi that show that fungus, fungi could survive traveling or getting dispersed like thousands of miles, um, like from Africa to Italy and, and establishing in an environment. Um, so there is evidence that that could be the case, um, but for valley fever, we, we don't know. Um, it's something that people are trying to work on and there's, there's more uh, like dust scientists that are getting involved in valley fever research that have methods that we don't know how to do to track dust and, you know, the physics of dust. So hopefully those answers will come soon, but um, we don't know exactly that either. <laughs> There's a lot of we don't knows in, in valley fever research. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like it, it, there's a lot of uh, things that could be studied. Yeah. Um, Virginia again asks, uh, you know, um, great presentation, she says, uh, is there a hypothesis or any research into why people are getting so sick in Southern Arizona, but not so much in Northern Arizona, despite finding it here? That's a great question as well. Um, I think the, 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 I guess the, 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 the obvious answer is that there's more people down in the Valley, Tucson, Phoenix area. So, there's more just cases and more people reporting it. Um, I think it's probably a little bit of that. There's more people, more people getting diagnosed, more doctors know how, knowing how to diagnose it because it's an endemic, highly endemic area. Um, but also I think I would hypothesize that if you know we, we find it in Northern Arizona, it's possible that this climate, um, the fungus evolved to be a little less virulent, or maybe it just has a more host, animal host, that it doesn't get transmitted to humans as much. Um, it could be, it's probably a, a mix of a bunch of factors. Um, but I think the thing that stands out is just there's more people down there and better diagnoses down there. But I'm sure there's a lot of different factors. A yeah. um, couple more questions. Uh, uh, 
uh, Carla asked from Flagstaff, uh, is climate change exacerbating these, these fungi? Yeah, another great question. Um, I think climate change is exacerbating everything, but um, also the, the emergence of novel pathogens to um, naive hosts. So if you, you know, I did, I, I'm a naive at some models. I've done some climate modeling with this pathogen. And if you put in the climate data from 50 years from now, um, you know, the, the, the Western United States is going to be hotter and drier. And it's a better, you know, if you, if you go north, it's going to be a better climate for Coxidioides. So if, you know, it does get dispersed via dust storm or wind, it might have a better chance to establish in these more northern areas or areas that aren't endemic now, but are hotter and drier, a, a perfect environment for uh, valley fever. And then you have a situation where you have a population that's naive to it. They don't have an immune response to it. And then there's potential for, um, you know, outbreaks and more infections. So yes, it's exacerbating. It could it potentially could exacerbate um, transmission. All right, and one last question that's mine. Um, uh, if you could be given, you know, a blank check <laughs> to, you know, fund something in, that you've always wanted to, to, to extend for your research, what, what would you use that check for? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would love to, you know, travel, you know, I guess let's just keep it to the Southwest, travel the Southwest and do extensive sampling on the soil, um, you know, throughout the region and uh, animal populations as well. So take blood um, and tissues to see not only valley fever um, uh, fluctu or, uh, you know, circulation, but other pathogens. So just look for you know, any novel viruses, you know, coronaviruses, you know, anything that could spill over, any novel bacteria. Um, yeah, just like do a big old road trip and, and sample for fungal pathogens and all sorts of pathogens. <laughs> All right. So, if there's any donors watching, uh, we know now what you would uh, you, you would fund on your wish list. There, a big old um, spider van would, <laughs> would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have one last question that came in just now um, from Sue in Scottsdale. Is valley fever found in mammal fecal matter? That's a great question. Um, so I've never detected it, and I've tried. Um, there's been some evidence in, in, in detecting it from fecal matter. Uh, I think, in, uh, in, I don't know the study, I think someone from South America detected it in bat guano um, in uh, Brazil or Argentina, I forget where it was. Um, but I, I've never been able to detect it. Um, we don't know if it could, if it's in the lungs and it disseminates, if it could passage the gut um, and, and survive. Um, so we don't know. Uh, there's evidence, but I've never been able to detect it. But again, I've never really sampled that hard. So it could, it could be, you know, it could be there. And I just never uh, had an opportunity to find it. Great. Well, Dan, thank you so much uh, for joining us and sharing your uh, passion uh, and your career with us. And so um, uh, thank you. And, and, you know, hopefully we'll see you next year when maybe all of this is better and we can have an in-person in presentation from you and see how things are going. Yeah, that, uh, would, be fever. that would be great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. All right. And thank you to all you uh, people watching. And remember, fill out the survey link. If you really enjoyed this event or have any feedback, uh, fill out that survey for us on our website, SciFest2020.org. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Todd.